dependencies. I will talk to you later. That's a good idea. All right. You ready? All right. The next talk in the session is about, uh, by Alexander, and it's not about Flash Meta, apparently. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm Alex. Uh, today I want to tell you about our framework for program synthesis, PROSE, formerly known as Flash Meta. This is joint work with Sumil Gulwani at MSR and a great group of folks at both Microsoft and Microsoft Research. So I want to start with a question. Why do people create frameworks in the first place? When do one-off technologies stop being sufficient? The general answer is it happens when a technology becomes popular. We call this process industrialization or tech transfer. A medieval scribe, for instance, can easily copy one book, but if the demand is for dozens of books, at some point somebody goes and creates a printing press. This talk is about a printing press for program synthesis. It's been called the ultimate dream of computer science since 1950s. The idea boils down to, well, if you have a user's intent in the form of some specification, can you write an algorithm that will search a programming language and find a program in this language that is consistent with a spec? Program synthesis has been hot and popular in academia over the last five to 15 years, mostly due to the Moore's law and advancements in constraint solving. Question is whether it's ready for industry. We argue that yes, it is. There are several examples. One is, for instance, FlashFill, a feature in Microsoft Excel, which does string transformation, by example, written by Sumit and two of his students. Another is a company called Trifacta that does data wrangling scripts, by example, developed by a group of professors at Berkeley, University of Washington, and MIT. An older one is a project called Spiral, 15-year-old project that does synthesis of circuits for stream processing, uh, this picture shows a core team that did Spiral, and it doesn't fit about 100 more collaborators. This slide may tell us a pattern. If you want to build a successful industrial technology based, built on synthesis, you need several people with PhD degrees and several years of time at your disposal. As someone in industry would put it, this does not scale. So something's got to be done about it. We did. We call it PROS. Program synthesis is an example, says DK. In a couple hours, apparently, you will be able to go, download it, play with it, do research on top of it. And in the rest of this talk, I'll tell you how it works, what have we done with it, and what interesting things you can enable with it. Pros wouldn't be possible without prior work. In synthesis, there are three main approaches that have different strengths and weaknesses. It all started with deductive synthesis from 1980s, which is incredibly fast. It doesn't do any kind of search, just walk over the grammar, but it acquires complete domain axiomatization, which is a real pain to provide. A more recent initiative, syntax-guided synthesis, addresses that, saying, well, how about we provide the DSL and write a generic algorithm that takes this DSL as input. It drastically reduces the search space, but as a downside, this algorithm cannot leverage any domain-specific insights that may have been used in that DSL. And there is a third approach which tries to mitigate that, saying, okay, in how about we write a very specialized algorithm for one very specialized DSL, and it will take as input usually examples instead of a complete logical spec, because that's what end users are comfortable with providing. That works, it is actually really fast. The downside is, you need several years of work, and the result is absolutely inextensible because it was written for one DSL. If you make a change to this DSL, you have to rewrite the entire thing from scratch. If you recall an equation for program synthesis for a few slides back, you'll notice that all of these approaches address one of the dimensions of the problem particularly well. We combine them all together in one framework. Our search algorithm is based on deduction, our programming language is a DSL provided by a domain expert, and the user intent is specified using input output examples. The result is a pipeline which is useful for four different types of personas. So it starts with a set of synthesis strategies. We provide some of our own, but you can easily add more. 
This is what we call a metasynthesizer framework, and that's what researchers like to do. It takes as input a DSL definition written by a domain expert and produces a synthesizer. It's an executable on top of which developers can build different apps and UIs. These apps, at runtime, take as input as input-output examples from an end user and learn a set of programs that are consistent with it. We will meet these four characters later in the talk when we will wear different hats depending on what kind of application we want to enable at the moment. Right now, let's talk about each dimension of the problem in details. I'll start with a DSL. Here's an example of a DSL. This is actual flash fill, a portion of it, in the prose DSL definition language. It's a context-free grammar with a set of standard operators and in addition your own custom operators. Most importantly, you can use arbitrarily complex business logic as long as it's accessible as an executable, be it regular expressions or web page DOM as the previous speaker used or anything, really. Uh, important, also importantly, DSL did not end up like that. DSL design is an art. It takes a ton of iterations where you write something, try it on your tasks, rewrite it again, repeat until convergence. A framework needs to facilitate that so that you don't end up rewriting your search algorithm again with the DSL every time. The second dimension is a specification. This one is provided by end users, and end users are most comfortable with input-output examples. Given this phone number, here's the how you can transform it to a phone number that I want to. This is easy, simple, they can write it really fast, but sometimes even that is too cumbersome. Consider this task. I have a list of references copied verbatim from a PDF paper, and I want to extract a list of authors and publication years from it. It's a one-off task. I don't care about any other files in the world. What is an input to this task? A text file. What is an output? A sequence of selections. So if I provide you an input-output examples, example, I've already completed my task in the first place, and I don't need program synthesis anymore. <laughs> what I would like to do is give you a subset of the desired selection, some couple of selections, couple of years. This is what we call an inductive specification. It's a compromise between a complete universally quantified spec, which only experts can usually write, and input-output examples, which end users are perfectly okay with, but they are too constraining in some scenarios. In general, it's a formula over atomic predicates over the output of a program on a certain input. Notice we constrain the output, not the behavior of the program, not the structure of a program, just the result of it, and that is, again, something that end users can easily do. This forms a skeleton of our problem definition, not the entirety of a problem definition. The complication is examples are inherently ambiguous. Let me tell you how problematic that is. So here's the same task, extract publication years from a file, and it's a small sample of programs that are consistent with two examples, and I'm not showing you a couple billions more which did not fit on the slide. Uh, if you want to somehow disambiguate between them and produce the best program for a user, we need to learn an entire set of them and then apply some disambiguation technique, be it ranking or maybe ask the user some questions, anything really, as long as you have the entire set of candidates at your disposal or even a portion of it. How do you represent several billions programs? Well, there is a data structure called version space algebra. You can read more about it in the paper. The bottom line is any synthesis strategy that wants to deal with such programming by example tasks needs to build on top of something like this data structure. We encourage you to develop your own synthesis strategies on top of our common APIs. Pros allows anything on Earth, essentially. In this talk, I'm going to describe one of them, the one that we provide, deductive strategy. It's built on two observations. The first one, when you're doing deduction, also general principle of divide and conquer tells you that you want to somehow invert the semantics of your operator. If I want the operator to satisfy a spec, what should its sub-expression satisfy in order for the entire thing to hold? For example, if I have a concat function and these two examples of strings that it needs to produce, we can ask a question. What should a prefix program of a concat satisfy? Well, we can't know for sure what it produces. 
but we know that it produces some prefix of an output on these inputs. So we can as well just unite all prefixes with a disjunction and output it. Okay, that was easy. Let's ask about a suffix. We can ask a similar question and actually produce an exactly similar answer. It should produce some suffix. The problem now is we cannot combine the two results back together. A program that produces some prefix of a string together with a program that produces some suffix of a string does not necessarily combine into a program that produces exactly the entire string. The word sum is crucial here. There is an ancient logical technique that deals with such problems called scholarization. Here, we want to replace an existential quantifier with a fixed value of expression that it quantifies. For instance, given a specific prefix, what should a suffix program be? That question we can actually answer, and it's just take whatever the rest of the string remained, and that is what the suffix program should produce. This exercise that we just did was two small questions that we answered about how to inverse the semantics of a concat operator under certain conditions. We call this exercise witness functions. Witness functions are tiny pieces of domain-specific insight that characterize the operator and can be reused in any DSL that includes that operator. Most importantly, they do not include any program synthesis reasoning, search algorithm reasoning, or you don't even need expertise in program formal logic in the first place. We actually verified that claim, as I show you in a couple of slides. When we implemented pros, we went ahead and asked, okay, what applications can it enable? So we did some research. First of all, we discovered that it unifies about a dozen prior papers on programming by example, each of which was a top tier conference publication. We actually re-implemented some of them from scratch. Here is a sample. In all of the cases, as you can see, the development time reduced sometimes 4x, and the amount of code required for this implementation was reduced sometimes by 8x. Uh, most importantly, in the bottom three rows, people who did the implementation had nothing to do with the original paper. In the bottom two rows, the person who did the implementation did not have any formal logic background or expertise. He was just a domain expert. The resulting code was order of magnitude more extensible and actually usable in an industrial app. So that speaks for a software engineering aspect of the framework. What about performance? Well, typically, when you go from a one-off solution to a general framework, you expect a performance hit simply because now you have 100 more layers of abstractions involved. However, you can leverage any algorithmic advances in the framework itself and any application that builds on it automatically benefits. So it's really an apples to oranges comparison. The result fluctuates from two times slower to three times faster or the other way around. For an application, what matters are absolute numbers. Let me show you one example, the flash extract application. I'm gonna show you a scatter plot where each point is a task. And I will tell you how many examples were needed to complete this task, how much time did it take a framework to learn it, and what was the space of the resulting data structure that stored the set of all compliant programs. So here's the entire spectrum. As you may see, the median time required for all these tasks is under one second, and it's perfectly manageable in terms of number of examples or the space. Remember, the, bottom, the x axis is in some sense logarithmic in the number of programs that are actually represented in a data structure. So this is perfectly applicable for an industrial application, and our colleagues at Microsoft actually implemented it in several. This is just tip of the iceberg. There are many more that I'm not showing. They're in development or many more that you may think of. One is email parsing. So if you have a structured email, like a flight ticket or a package delivery, you expect your digital assistant to summarize it in a nice card like this. Since email is essentially HTML, what people have done historically is write manually a program that parses this HTML, extracts the relevant fields, and puts together a card. If tomorrow Expedia goes and changes their web page layout, the program breaks, 
Cortana cannot parse the email anymore. Users are unhappy. The entire pipeline is broken. What Fox at Cortana team did instead was they used our technology to automatically generate the programs that extract these fields from emails. By example, on the developer's machines. Here, the developer is the one doing synthesis, and the artifacts of this learning process are now run 24-7 somewhere in the cloud, extracting information from the emails. In a different scenario, the learning actually happens on the end user's machine. So here the target audience is an IT admin who regularly have to parse huge textual logs of data. In PowerShell, there is a commandlet called convert from string to which you can provide a template with marked examples of what you want to extract from a file. And it generalizes these examples into an extraction script and applies this extraction script on the rest of your gigabytes of data. Admins call it magical. Some people say it saves them hours of work daily. And again, this is just a tip of the iceberg of possible domains and applications. There are many more. So I encourage you to go download it, play with it, do any kind of research or apps on top of it. You can use our Playground app to do data wrangling applications. And actually, if you have a repetitive task for data extraction, you can easily use it. If you have any questions, shoot us an email or just drop by the MSR table right there next to the registration desk, and I'll show you a demo. Thank you. Let's take some questions. That's impressive work. But can you say a bit about the scope of this work? So are you going to replace Spiral with mm -hmm. this approach? Spiral, Spiral particularly no, because Spiral relies on 